2011, for the first time ever, Skyrim was released. Deus Ex Human Revolution, The Witcher 2, Battlefield 3, Portal 2. It's a good year for PC games and a great year to get into PC gaming. If you'd asked 10 people for recommendations on the best way to join the PCMR on a budget, nine of them would have told you to pick up the Intel i5-2500K. Over a decade later, while the phrase, just get an i5 mate, still rings true, old 4-thread models like this Sandy Bridge chip aren't exactly what people have in mind. If you'd taken that advice back in 2011, could you still be happily gaming on it in 2022? It's hard to think of a CPU that's been as universally adored as the i5-2500K. The next four generations of Intel CPUs found themselves being thought of as no more than iterative refreshes of the Sandy Bridge formula, and by the time of the 8000 series, enthusiasts' attentions were being split by a resurgent AMD. As recently as the 7th gen, the i5-2500K had been competitive with the latest and greatest CPUs Intel had to offer. However, the 7th gen was a long time ago. More games are taking advantage of the current trend for more cores and threads, new instruction sets are needed in more games, and IPCs have gone through the roof. Even with its legendary overclocking headroom, the i5 is more comparable to a Pentium or Celeron from the latest generations than even an i3. Still, thanks to its overclocking and four real physical cores, it should still meet the minimum system requirements of most games in 2022 and 2023. Considering it can now be picked up for about a tenner, this has the potential to be an incredible value for budget gaming. To find out, I'm testing in an ASUS Sabertooth Z77 motherboard overclocked to a fairly pedestrian 4.5GHz, mainly for the sake of comparison to the Sandy Bridge e-chips I've tested recently, cooled under an excessively fancy RGB cooler from Zalman, and paired with 16 gigs of DDR3 2133 and an RTX 3070 to reduce the chance of being GPU limited. A couple of years back I tested Valorant on a mobile i7 with and without hyperthreading, and began to wonder if maybe this game had something against virtual cores. Now, testing the i5, I think I might have been onto something. The i5-2500K at 4.5GHz beats the i7-4930K at the same clock speeds with an average of 198fps. In fact, it's only 8fps lower than the i7-3960X, my current reigning vintage CPU performance champion. It's no surprise that Battlefield 5 returns a disappointing result on the 2500K, because the same holds true for everything else I've tested in Sandy Bridge or Ivy Bridge so far. It's still not unimpressive to see that it manages to score an average of 82 FPS, about 20% lower than the i7-3820. The stutter is pretty unbearable, and I'm told DX11 improves this, but I've also seen much better results from later CPUs. If you want to see me take a deeper dive into this pretty old game, let me know in the comments. Fortnite is a bit more my speed, and seemingly the 2500K also approves. The 194 average in performance mode at 1440 high with 66% scaling is about 5% faster than the hyper-threaded i7-3820, and about 5% slower than the 6-core 3960X. Back in the day, it wasn't uncommon for people to overclock these chips to 5GHz, so if you want one of these for Fortnite, I think a more adventurous OC should push you past the 200fps mark. Overwatch 2 isn't quite as agnostic on the subject of cores and threads as the other titles I've looked at so far, but it still seems quite happy with a plain vanilla quad-core like this i5. The 137fps average is slower than the Sandy and Ivy extremes I've seen so far, but by no more than about 20 frames. The big drop is the 1% and 0.1% lows, where the 2500K only scores about half as well as something like the i7-3960X. Relatively speaking, that's still pretty amazing for a £10 consumer-grade CPU.
Okay, now for the challenging stuff. Without RT, the 2500K again does amazingly well in Spider-Man, comparing with the newer and far more expensive i7-4930K with a near 64 FPS average and tolerable 1% lows. Turning on the RT, however, and things aren't so spectacular. Averages now drop off to just 32 FPS, whereas the 6-core offerings manage between 50 and 80% higher, and with much better frame pacing as well. And of course, if Spider-Man is challenging, so is Cyberpunk. The non-RT configuration is no doubt playable, averaging 40 FPS, though the lows are a bit on the uh, low side. Everything else I've tested so far scores between 50 and 65 FPS, showing that for all its strengths, the 2500K is still short a few threads. This is made even more clear with RT enabled, where averages dip below 30, and smooth gameplay just doesn't seem possible. Red Dead Redemption 2 holds up quite a bit better. My usual slow ride through Saint Denis is smooth enough, averaging 48 FPS, and with lows not dropping to the point of stuttering. The hyper-threaded i7-3820 does about 20% better despite the lower clock speeds, whereas the 6-core CPUs clock in over 75 FPS, seemingly showing that Red Dead Redemption 2 really does struggle with just 4 cores, at least from this generation of CPU. If you've watched my CPU reviews up to now, it should come as no surprise that the i5-2500K can't push Elden Ring to its 60fps cap very often. i7s of this generation can only manage a sub 50fps average, but again, the 2500K comes as a surprise. It's still only 50fps, and you will still experience frame time drops from time to time, but it seems the i5's extra 200MHz mean more to Elden Ring than the i7-3820's hyper-threading does. Finally, Civilization VI scores an average turn time of 7.82 seconds, about one quarter of a second slower than the quad-core i7-3820. Okay, okay, so that's pretty amazing stuff. Yes, the i5-2500K is still an incredible deal over a decade later, Yes, that's probably the headline most of you will take away from this video. I don't disagree. I was really impressed with how well the little quad-core did. But I have to bring in the context. Step forward to 2022 and there's plenty of CPUs that can do better. So if you're thinking of actually spending money on a platform from the days of the first Obama administration, just stop and think about whether you couldn't get better reliability and longevity out of something with at least DDR4 and maybe some multi-threading. If you can't justify the price of, say, a Ryzen 3 3100 or i3-10100 setup, then by all means, have at it. The i5-2500K should be a good pairing with something like a GTX 1650 Super or RX 590, but I wouldn't be tempted to try it out with ray tracing, so an RTX 2060 or 3050 might be a step too far. Also be aware that this platform uses PCI Express 2.0, so using a x8 or x4 card could potentially introduce a pretty painful bottleneck. That means you're probably better off matching this with an old Polaris card over an RX 6400 or 6500 XT. If you're looking for more nostalgic CPU reviews, check out this review of the i7-4930K. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.